Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to this beautiful uh, Wednesday afternoon. My name is Chris Woodfield uh, from the University of Plymouth, Low Carbon Devon project. Um, so yeah, make yourself at home. Um, it'd be great to see some faces. So if you're able to keep your cameras on, um, that'd be really much appreciated. And hopefully we can um, have a good conversation this afternoon. But yeah, welcome to uh, this Low Carbon Devon event focused on the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. Um, we're going to have some time together this afternoon just to chat in a bit more detail about what that is and um, who we are and what we're offering and how we could hopefully work together. So thank you for coming. Um, as I said, my name is Chris. I work on the Low Carbon Devon Project. And I'm just going to go through what we're going to, what we're going to explore today. Um, so I'm just going to outline a bit of the programme. So I'm going to do a little bit of an intro um, and just set the scene around sort of who we are and, and what we do. And then we're going to focus in on, on the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund and what that is, how it could be applicable for, for you and your, your enterprise or your project. Um, so we're going to hear from my colleague, Claire. And then we're going to hear from a few other people um, who we've been working with. So we're going to hear from Mark Howard from Regen around opportunities in the low carbon sector. And then also from the University of Plymouth as well, um, Dave Marshall, who's going to talk, sort of bring to life sort of partnership opportunities um, for local businesses working with researchers and academics. Um, and then we've got time for, for some discussion and questions that you may have as well. But it'd be really nice to just hear who you are. Um, if you're eight, that's fine uh, regarding audio only. Um, thank you, Kate. <laughs> um, be great to hear who you are, though, if, if you're able to sort of put in the chat, possibly, who you are and who you're representing today. It'd be really nice to just get a feel of, of who's in the room. Um, it'd also be great, actually, at this point, just to say hello to, just so you know who they are and when they're going to be speaking. Maybe we could just say hello to, to Claire, to, to Mark and to Dave, just for a quick intro and hello. Um, so hi, I'm Claire Pierce, and I'm the project manager of the Low Carbon Devon Project. Hi, I'm Dave. Sorry. <laughs> now go for it, Dave. <laughs> hi, Dave Marsh. I'm an innovation funding manager here at the University of Plymouth, uh, specialising specifically in the Knowledge Transfer Partnership Project. And hi, I'm Mark Howard. I'm from Regen. We're based up in Exeter. Um, we're a centre for energy expertise. Uh, I'm a project manager at Regen. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Mark, Dave and Claire. So we'll be hearing from, from them in more detail shortly. Um, but for now, I was just going to set the scene, really, and just if you don't know uh, what Low Carbon Devon, who we are and what we do, um, got, there's a few familiar names on, on the list, but there's also some new ones as well. So welcome uh, or welcome back. My role is a knowledge exchange officer, and really this, this project has come around because we need to take action around the climate emergency and the low carbon economy. And now is the time to be doing that. You know, it's a really exciting space within what we're working in at the moment. It's a real opportunity. And, and we, you know, through the project, we have an amazing opportunity to offer practical and solution focused support to local businesses. Um, and this slide is really just emphasizing that the time is now to be taking action and very grateful to be working on this project hosted by the University of Plymouth um, through the Sustainable Earth Institute. And we are funded by something called the European Regional Development Fund. And the Low Carbon Devon project is all around trying to put that, um, those solutions into action and work with local businesses um, to sort of support, facilitate and empower action around the low carbon economy. So really it's just, a buzz of excitement at the moment and I'm sort of really excited to 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 chat to local organizations to see and more importantly to listen and to see how we can work together to hear the challenges you're facing and to see how we could potentially support so it's a two the projects are really a two a, a partnership a two-way thing and it's you know we have some access to to researchers and, and expertise within the university but it's really a two-way relationship 
and really keen to sort of work with you on challenges you're facing and see how we can overcome those challenges or rise to those challenges together. So really as the time is now, and our project is focused on SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises. And we have sort of four areas of research um, or four areas of focus, sorry, on the project. Um, so the first of those is, well, in no particular order, we, the project is sort of outlined as a whole, low carbon Devon, but we have research collaborations. So that's one area of support that we can offer through the project, and that's collaborations with our researchers. So industrial research fellows that work on the project with myself and, and with Claire. And we have a range of areas. So those are the four areas outlined on the slide. Um, a range of different areas. And, and, and those areas have come about because of, of sort of market demands, but also we have here at the university a sustainability hub. Um, which is a sort of thriving living lab space on the campus. And it's an example of the sustainable retrofit um, on the university campus. So some of the research is focused on the green walls, for example, you see there. Um, we have the living wall, the green wall at the university sustainability hub. So the research is focusing on, on research, but it's also focusing on connecting with local organizations and Devon SMEs who are interested in these areas of research and to see how we can work together um, on sort of developing new products or services and um, connecting up on those specific areas. So if you're thinking, actually, um, I really want to chat to them, I really want to find out more, then, then do get in touch and, and we can make that happen. That, that's part of my role. Um, so that's research collaborations. Something else we can offer through the project is a internship program. So I'm overseeing something called Future Shift, which is the Low Carbon Devon Internship Program, which again is support for, for Devon-based organisations. And it's to provide a fully funded um, student or graduate to work on a low carbon Devon, to work on a low carbon project. So again, it's around developing an idea or a project into a product or service. And it's really focused on maybe carrying out a feasibility study, um, doing a scoping study. It's, it's to provide that practical support through the intern, through the student or graduate, but it's combined with this leadership development. So we're really passionate about empowering our students and graduates to be the future change makers we need and, and this future fit leadership development. And we've just finished one of the cohorts um, for the internship program. And there was a, just on the slider, a few examples of the types of projects and the types of organizations we're working with um, through the internship program. So these three months projects have, have just finished and there are a whole host of things. So it, that's another area of support through the project we could explore. Um, and I'm really keen to chat about further as well. And sort of on top of that or building on that is we're running a series of events and workshops. So like this one, um, but also around particular themes, um, around particular ideas that come from, from the local business community. So we, we've got a series of take action workshops um, and inspire ambition events. And there's, a, there's an example on the slide of, of ones coming up. So, so do come along if you're interested and, and check out the system shift series of events on the Low Carbon Devon web pages. Um, so the next event, as you can see, is next week. Um, but we've got a whole host of things until the end of the year as well. But why we're here today, um, so that's just the flavor of the project and other things we're focusing on. Um, and we're really keen to, through the project, to sort of chat to you and work out what the best fit is. Um, so it could be the internship program. It could be working with one of the research fellows that I've highlighted or it could be focusing on um, the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. So yeah, there's a number of things we can offer through the project. It's a really exciting time and, and really excited to sort of explore and see how we can sort of put those practical solutions into action around the low carbon agenda. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Claire Pierce, um, who's gonna highlight the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund in a bit more detail. So yeah, over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Chris. So the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. Ooh. 
So I wanted to give yeah. you um, a bit of background and to really highlight what's on the website already to really just bring it to life rather than just repeat what information is already out there. So the background behind this is basically we've got funding and it's to stimulate new product or service development in the low carbon sector in Devon. And Chris has obviously run through what the low carbon Devon project covers and it's to go beyond those core activities of the project. So um, Chris mentioned our four industrial research fellows, Green Walls, Creative Industries, um, Power Electronics and Energy Efficiency in Buildings. The point of this fund is to enable businesses to actually work with the broader academic body at the university. So it could be around robotics, it could be engineering, anything that we've got. So basically this funding of up to £7,500 per company and the funding is there to address challenges facing the low carbon sector, encourage and enable business academic collaborations, um, encourage diversification from one sector into low carbon, and very importantly, to seed further collaborative work. So using that money, that time of the academic to actually investigate, can we work together, do that initial work, and then go for other funding like Innovate UK or KTP, which is what Dave will be talking about in a bit. So to be eligible for the fund, we need a collaboration between a Devon SME and a University of Plymouth academic. So the definition of the SME is one probably you all know by now because it's been around for a long time. Um, less than 250 employees, turnover of less than 50 million euros and not more than 25% owned by a non-eligible company. And the key thing is here, it's working with the University of Plymouth academic researcher. So you might say, why can't I have the money direct as a business? Why do I need to collaborate with the university? What are the benefits of it? Well, as mentioned, we've got a lot of um, different disciplines that we cover at the university from digital technology, marine engineering, environmental science, behavior change, robotics. And we wanted through this fund to give businesses access to that expertise. So you can work with an academic to solve a technical challenge, for example, to access the breadth and depth of knowledge around one particular area, which might be key to your business. Um, analyze data or independent validation of what you're doing, research a new market, and access to specialist technical support. So there's a wealth of reasons to engage with um, academics. And rather than just hear from me, um, recently at the Sustainable Earth um, Conference back in June, FinCEN Tech and Dr. Tina Joshi spoke about the benefits of them working together through a different fund uh, at the university um, around a novel device with regard to disinfection. And technical director Tristan Williams said that he found the academic partnership enabled him to access technologies and expertise he thought never thought was possible. Um, and together they've actually used developed the science, they've tested the product together and then gone on to influence policy and then deploy the technology. So a real a virtuous cycle of activity together. And he said particularly he found it interesting to be able to discuss things, the same things, but from different perspectives, but find a mutual ground. And from there, they were able to research and then develop. And um, they also said they collaborated locally to act globally, which I thought was very powerful. Um, and then from the academic's point of view, Dr. Joshi said that she said, you know, she's using her research to innovate, to have new ideas that are leading to tangible developments and also making contribution to her research area. So for academics, it's really important to inform and test their research, to see their research have impact and legs in industry and society, and to inform teaching, to prepare the students that they work with for the world of industry. And very much, the impression I've got, it's very much the outcome is greater than the sum of its parts for both parties. So with the fund itself, the main things to remember are the deadline, which is the 28th of October. We still got a month, which is great. Um, and you can still contact us before that with inquiries or get your applications in now, whichever. Um, we'll be assessing those in early November. We've got an awards panel made up of a, of a couple of university ex, um, colleagues, but also um, external organizations as well um, to inform the application selection. We'll let successful and let successful applicants know by the end of November. And then the successful applicants will have um, six months to complete the work, and then we'll be there to support them with the next steps. So supporting going on for further funding and so on. So just to summarize, what are we looking for? We're looking for applications that lead to new product or service development that are addressing low carbon challenges, opportunities. We want to know what will be delivered, how it will be delivered, who will be delivering it, and also future opportunities. You might not know that, that's not key, but actually we want there to be a future opportunity after this initial six months of work. 
So for more information, you can go to our website, which is there for the application form and the guidance. Um, and then you just need to simply apply by emailing the application form to us at sustainabilityhub at plymouth.ac.uk. I think that is it. So hand back to you, Chris. Yep, awesome. Uh, thanks, Claire. And yeah, if you've got sort of questions that have arisen um, through that, do, do keep them in mind. We can sort of, we've got plenty of time at the end, hopefully, to, to run through those questions. Um, but for now, yeah, I think that's, that's um, sort of flow, flow straight into to Mark, who, who's going to be uh, Mark Howard from Regen. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Mark. Great, thanks, Chris. Hopefully you can see my slides. Somebody nod. We can see we can see the PowerPoint. Yeah, if you okay, is it not gone full screen? There we go. Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chris and Claire. Um, so yeah, I briefly introduced myself earlier. I'm Mark Howard. I'm, I'm from Regen. I'm going to talk a bit um, about the sort of opportunities in uh, the sort of low carbon energy sector in Devon presented by Net Zero and the Net Zero Challenge. Um, I'll also take this opportunity to say that I think coincidentally to me being asked, um, I was involved in Analyze Transfer Partnership at the start of my career, uh, and I can't sing its praises highly enough. So um, there's one more, one more in, the, in the ring there. Um, so I'll talk briefly about Regen. So we're a extra based organisation. We're a centre for energy expertise, um, and we're a mission led not for profit. So. <clears throat> Uh, our mission is to accelerate the decarbonisation of the energy system across the UK, um, and, and that's what drives all of the work that we do. Um, we do that by uh, using insight and analysis and collaborating with um, local authorities, with any large energy users, uh, with community energy groups to try and better understand the challenges and the opportunities that um, Net Zero presents to the energy sector and how we can move that along. So we're often involved in um, future looking uh, pieces of analysis, looking at what the future energy system might look like, or innovation projects that are trying to deal with tricky areas that need resolving in terms of you know, decarbonising the electricity grid or the gas grid, or you know, retrofitting our housing stock. Get involved in a wide wide range of activities. Uh, my role at Regen is to to manage projects um, and provide my sort of expertise on heat and buildings. That's my general area. Um, we're also a membership led organisation. I'm not here to sell membership, but we are a membership organisation. So if you um, want to support our mission, you can become a member and get various benefits from doing that. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to talk about the, the challenge and the opportunities. So the big challenge that we're all aware of is um, we have to meet net zero by 2050. We need to prevent global temperatures from rising above uh, pre-industrial levels uh, to avoid catastrophic climate change. So there's a big challenge there. Um, there's a huge opportunity for all sectors because all sectors are going to need to change in one way or another, as this graph um, shows, which is from the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, which is really worth looking up if you haven't. It's, um, part of the, it's part of the SME Climate Hub approach to um, helping SMEs reduce their emissions, and that's something we've been quite strongly involved with. Um, yeah, we have a net zero commitment in the UK, so there are strong policy drivers now pushing all sectors in the direction of becoming low carbon and net zero. Um, and that means, as I said, there's challenges for all sectors, but there's also opportunities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that might mean in Devon and what that might mean for sort of energy sector in Devon. Um, so in Devon, we've got a, a Devon net zero task force. I'm not part of it actually, but one of my colleagues has been closely involved um, and they've been looking at what, what Net Zero 2050 would look like for Devon. And they've produced uh, an interim Devon carbon plan. And this is a, just a shot from the, the energy part of that. Um, and again, if, you haven't, if you're not aware of that, if you haven't looked at it, it's really worth looking at. Um, I've got a web link in there. Um, really, really fascinating and, and comprehensive look at what Net Zero might mean for Devon. Um, and this interim plan has highlighted that things probably a lot of us knew, which is we need a lot more energy efficiency measures deployed in our buildings and in our appliances. We need more active transport, so more walking and cycling, lots more renewable energy. We need to move to low carbon heat from fossil heat. We need low carbon vehicles as we ban industrial um, internal combustion engine vehicles by 
uh, middle of the middle of the century, we we need digitization and smart integration of our energy using systems so that we can get the most out of our low carbon energy system. Um, and they've also identified a, a pilot for carbon capture and storage, which is potentially part of the solution is capturing carbon as part of industrial processes, um, as well as reducing the amount of carbon we produce. Um, so that's a really interesting sort of overview of what, what the energy system in Devon might need to, to do to change to meet net zero by 2050. Um, one of the things that Regen does um, as part of our work is we, um, we provide a regional breakdown of um, something called the future energy scenarios. So the national grid annually produces a series of future energy scenarios that look out to 2050. And they say, how would the electricity network need to change to meet our net zero targets? So across a, a range of four scenarios, two of which meet our, our net zero goal and two of which don't, um, they look at all sorts of um, changes in the system, what sorts of technologies will be deployed and to what extent and how that might impact the energy system of the future so that they can continue to build the right energy system to allow us to become net zero. And part of uh, the work that we do is that we work with a range of the network operators to look at what that means on a really local level. So sometimes down to street level, but um, breaking it down to, to quite a granular level. Um, and what I've done here is just pulled out some data for Devon from our most recent uh, assessment of the Southwest and Wales license area um, and a couple of key technologies and really just highlighting that there's huge growth opportunities in all the areas that you would probably expect to see from what I've already said. So massive growth in um, installation of electric heat pumps and low carbon heat of solar PV, both domestic and, and non-domestic, um, and in, um, in the use of electric vehicles as we approach 2050. And that obviously extends to electric vehicle chargers as well. Um, there's some quite interesting dips towards 2050 in the EV charts, um, which is quite interesting to do with assumptions about shared transport as we get to autonomous vehicles around them. I haven't fully unpicked all of those assumptions, but um, kind of one of the interesting things that often comes out of these future looking analysis. Um, so I guess the key message there is that there's a lot of technology opportunities there um, in terms of um, providing those services. Um, in terms of jobs, um, we did a piece of analysis highlighted here that has looked at the sort of green jobs opportunity presented by Net Zero. And again, it's a really positive message that there is huge opportunities in all regions for, um, for green jobs. And, and Devon's got some areas that are really well aligned to, to those sectors. Um, the government's this year formed a green job task force that plans to deliver a quarter of a million new low carbon jobs by 2030. So that's sort of doubling the number of jobs in the low carbon sector um, in the next 10 years, nine years, and, and a target of, of um, you know, really exceeding that and getting two million jobs. So there's lots of push in the sector at the moment. Um, and it's really nice to see. I've been in the sector for well over a decade and it really feels like it is you know, the time is now, as Chris, Chris said, the, the time is now for action, but also things are really happening and changing now. Um, and that's very exciting for me, really optimistic. Lots of projects that have been talked about for, for a decade are starting to come to fruition and things are really starting to grow. Um, so I think it is a really exciting time. And there is a lot of opportunity there. Um, specifically, I'll talk a little bit about heating buildings now, um, just because that's kind of my area. Um, so the... Um, Climate Change Committee did some analysis looking at you know, optimal path to net, net zero to 2050. Um, and they estimate that we need about 300,000 new jobs across the country in heat and buildings. So that's if you sort of pro rata that down to how many buildings there are in Devon, you're talking about 11,000 new jobs in Devon. And that's in all forms of, sort of trades looking at um, planning and delivering retrofit. So sort of architects and retrofit planners. Um, people setting up factories to build new energy efficient products and insulation products and people actually delivering those on site. So again, there's lots of opportunities there in and around improving our buildings and improving our comfort. Um, the photo here is from an, our, in, not our innovation project actually, it's an innovation project that we were involved in in, um, in the Midlands, looking at whole house retrofit. Um, and that, yeah, that showed some of the exciting opportunities. Um, we, we learned a lot from that. Um, a few sort of product specific, you know, heat and buildings examples that I've seen in the past few years um, beyond the sort of solar panels that you'd expect to see are um, on that specific innovation project. Um, we saw people setting up a, a temporary factory in near, near the project site to off-site manufacture insulation panels that could be wrapped around a building like a tea cosy to deliver um, 
a much more efficient building in a really short space of time to um, for a better cost and do it more accurately. Um, so there's lots of really interesting opportunities there. Um, the, there's a sort of another example of wall insulation systems that are being developed as part of other innovation projects, I think are really interesting. Um, we, we've got a huge amount of buildings in, in the UK that really need a lot of work to make them um, less drafty and warmer and have their heating systems improved. And I think there's huge scope for um, new products and services in and around there. And these are just a few highlights. Um, one of my favourites is the little orange and black robot, which is a QBOTS robot that's won lots of awards. Um, that you lift up a floorboard and send it under the floor of a of a home and it sprays insulation onto the underside of the floor, massively reducing heat loss through floors and um, and not having to empty a house of all its furniture and pull up all of the flooring. So all these different things have, have come through in the past few years um, and are just like a tiny snippet, I think, of the opportunities that there are for improved products and uh, and sort of solutions within just, and that's just in heating buildings because that's the area that I know about. Um, so the last thing that I'll talk about as well is that I think that there's also loads of other opportunity that's probably unexpected. Um, so put up the picture of a tap, which seems really mundane, but that was a really interesting outcome of one of the innovation projects we looked at, which was looking at providing whole house retrofit in, um, in social housing where um, you know, efficient modern techniques for applying insulation we used and um, very exciting novel forms of low carbon heat we used with uh, you know, great um, ventilation systems and PV generation systems and all of those things. Um, and tenants were really pleased about all of that, but were really, really interested in getting garden taps as, as much as the exciting technology and the reduced bills. A lot of them were actually can I have a garden tap? I've been asking for one for a decade. That would be really nice. Some of them were just interested in what the look would be like. Can it be pink, please? Can it be purple? Not the tap, the facades. And that stems to a more serious point, which is, um, I think, certainly as, as an energy industry, it tends to attract very tech-focused people. Um, and I think um, there's certainly an element of getting over-obsessed on talking about the technology and the wonderful technology and not necessarily selling people what they want. So I think there's... I think there's a great opportunity for collaboration there between sort of tech organisations and maybe more uh, consumer focused or social, sociology focused organisations or academics who could bring those two things together to, um, you know, develop low carbon solutions and giving people what they want, as well as giving the sort of outcomes that we all need to get to for net zero. So, um, yeah, various examples of that, but that's, I always sort of am reminded of that garden tap example um, from, from one of our projects. So, that's my sort of whistle-stop tour, I think, of um, what I think the opportunities might be in, in the energy sector in Devon, presented by Net Zero. Um, I hope that's useful and interesting. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in the chat or you know, the follow-up email. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I really like those, that really brought it to life. Thank you for that um, example. And um, yeah, so just re re reiterate really what Mark said. Um, if you've got any questions for him specifically um, around what he's presented or around regen or around sort of, yeah, other projects, then we can explore those um, at the end as well. So yeah, plenty of time for questions at the end. But I think, yeah, let's move on to Dave and then we can do a question Q&A all at the end. Um, so Dave. Are you there? And yeah, over to you. I think we can see, but can't hear you. Is that better? That's that's better. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. My pitch kept jumping around, so I couldn't get old. <laughs> can everyone see and hear that okay? Yeah. Lovely, great. Well, um, Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Mark. It's good to hear you've had a positive experience of uh, KTP. It makes this a, bit, a little bit more easy to present. Um, building on what Claire said, I'm, I'm, as we said earlier, I'm Dave Marshall, an innovation funding manager here at the university, and particularly focusing on noise transfer partnerships. And i say this really follows on from what Claire said, that hopefully you know, we can develop a strategic collaborative partnership between us all. Um, and which would cover many steps. And this could be one sort of quite important step in that area. It's one of Innovate's um, longest running initiatives. 
Uh, KTP in its various forms has been going for over 45 years now. And uh, the reason it stood the test of time is really because it has proven to uh, give very good benefits to all, part all partners. And it's also proven to develop a really good return on investment. So uh, with that being in the case, that being the case, why would it be um, discontinued? Um, so what is KTP? Well, um, again, this is similar to what Claire said. It's a collaboration. It's a collaboration between uh, a company, a business partner that has a, uh, a specific need that they need to address. It's a collaboration between the knowledge base, the University of Plymouth, who hopefully have the correct expertise and facilities uh, to address this, this, this strategic issue the company is having. Uh, and a third member of this partnership is what we call a KTP associate, which Mark would have been. And in fact, I uh, myself was a KTP associate as well before I uh, sort of came to be involved in you know, KTPs from this side of the fence. And the, the associate is a, a bright graduate who's uh, recruited to deliver the project. So just to give you a few fast facts about KTP, what, it, what it's all about. It's a tra transformational strategic project that should deliver benefits as to all partners. Uh, and in terms of the company partner, we're looking really at giving you a new skill, a new capability that will really lead to genuine and new wealth creation. KTP is flexible. It's, it can be between 12 to 36 months. Uh, the length of the project really, uh, well, what we're trying to do with the project really dictates the length of it. So um, it gives us that flexibility not to just be try and shoehorn everything into say a, a 12 or 24 month project or kind of stretch it out to meet that length of project. Um, there is a cost to, an S, to, uh, to the business in participation. Uh, and for an SME, that's a, about 30K a year, but that does represent a third of the cost. So uh, one way of looking at it is that the other funder is typically Innovate UK. So for every pound your contribution, you're getting two from an Innovate UK. And typically um, a project for a year has a budget of about 80K, which is just obviously has been met 30K. Uh, from the sorry 90k obviously 30k from the business and, nine, and 60k from Innovate UK um, if you are a large enterprise that ratio shifts slightly and then it's 50 50 so it's approximately 45k from the company 45k from uh, the Innovate UK um, KTP is available for many and most sectors sizes and types of organization um, the things that highlight what a KTP is really is when we submit it, the proposal, it's assessed against four key criteria, and that, that is innovation. So obviously it has to be, have to be looking at an innovative project, and it has to be a project that has impact, you know, for all partners, and particularly the business partner. It's got to be a challenging project. It can't be just something you could buy off the shelf or perhaps employ somebody from, uh, 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 employ somebody uh, for to deliver without the, the additionality of the university involvement. Um, and the third thing they're looking for uh, is a cohesiveness. Does it all hang together? Does it sell a logical and uh, sensible story? Uh, the good thing about KTP in particular, it's, it's one of Innovate's, um, uh, probably one of the only one of Innovate's sort of products that has sort of a lot of pre and post award support. This is from Plymouth University, but also there are dedicated people within Innovate UK called Knowledge Transfer Advisors, who were also with us for the duration of the projects as well, um, which adds also a lot of value and, and greatly increases the chances of success when we come to submit our proposals. Um, so in terms of business, well, why would a business really want to be involved with a, with a KTP? I mentioned earlier, you do get strategic input from an experienced knowledge transfer advisor. Uh, there's a network of these, uh, these people across the UK and our, our local guy is called Andy Treen. He's really, really great guy, he's really helpful, really knowledgeable. And he's with us from the ride, really from first contact. He helps us, starts off, I sometimes refer to him as kind of a dragon on Dragon's Den. He comes to, to see the university and the business. We give, give him our pitch as to what we're trying to do. He looks at it and he's got a big wallet in his pocket with money to hopefully fund us. And he sort of suggests, well, yes, that's a project or it's not a project or it could be good, but if you did this to it as well, then that would be even better. So it's a great guy to have on our side and very helpful in um, sort of setting up, you know, writing the bid and also running the project. Um, 
the main driver for the, and this is sort of very business focused because I appreciate that I think the majority of the, of the audience are, are from businesses and organisations. One of the key drivers behind KTP is to increase revenue for the company, profits, develop new products and new processes so that you, the company can grow and become more competitive. Um, the other part is collaboration is the access to the university expertise and facilities. That's all costed into the project. We want the organisations we work with, the companies to be competitive, gain you know, competitive advantage and accelerate themselves through innovation. And also, overall, the project will embed new expertise, new innovative knowledge, new capabilities. Um, and likewise, there are a similar a list of sort of benefits for academic um, collaborators, academic partners, because the idea of KTP that every partner should get something out of it, and likewise for the associate that we recruit to deliver the project. Typical benefits for um, a business. Now, I put these up just to show you a, a kind of uh, sort of benefits you may realise. Uh, these things are a little bit old because what Innovate UK does every sort of four or five years it looks at all the final reports that have been submitted to sort of highlight these sort of facts and figures. And then it does an analysis and draws the sort of typical benefits that a, unit, that a, a company in particular would expect to see. Um, so as you can see, 60K um, pre-tax profit during the life of the KTP. The way KTPs are assessed is we look at what's, what arises during the duration of the KTP, which could be anywhere from one to three years. What sort of benefits is that realising? And then they're looking at the following few years afterwards to see that the full impact of the noise transfer partnership. Um, and there, they, from the past analysis, it was 600K over the three years following completion. And profits typically were about 650K. Obviously, these are averages across all sorts of businesses, all sorts of sectors. So they are um, sort of representative. They've also found that sort of companies usually invest in further research and development uh, to do further innovative things. Usually get at least two highly skilled jobs created and at least 20 staff trained. And this associate that I mentioned is um, who's really getting embedded in the company throughout the KTP. The aspiration is hopefully that at the end of that, they'll stay with the KTP as a very valuable um, member of the team. And we found 65% typically uh, would remain with the, with the company at the end of the project. Uh, the main focus of KTP historically has been on innovative projects, specifically making new products, developing new processes, new skills. Uh, recently, there was a new initiative launched, which was called Management KTPs. This was looking at more the business processes, looking at strategic management based projects, as it says there, and they're specifically um, sort of interacting with um, the UK's world class business schools to develop those, more of those kind of business supporting um, aspects. Um, this funding, if memory serves, has to be spent, I think, by um, April 24. So this is kind of winding down a little bit. But at the moment, it's very much there and very much encouraging management or sort of KTPs if, you know, you're looking at the, more that side of the business rather than developing new products and processes. Just by way of a few examples of the companies we've worked with, I'm not going to go into too much detail with these, um, hopefully some of the one some of these names you may be familiar with <laughs> uh, red paddle company they do um, stand up inflatable paddle boards so that was looking at innovations in that sector blue Fruit software are based in cornwall um, they were looking at uh, compliance software for medical devices uh, particularly using an agile software development process which is quite novel hopefully everyone will have heard of langage farm <laughs> If you go and buy cream in a, in a shop, there's a good chance it'll either be Langage or Rodders. So, um, yeah, we've worked with Langage Farm looking at new product development and also gate, letting them understand the structure of them, some of their products by looking at electron microscopy images. Um, just to let you know as well, we're currently recruiting for three other projects. We've got one with ADSL, that's a, a chemical um, analysis company in Paynton, looking at uh, specifically CBD based products. Um, we're looking at a company, Artemis Optical in Plymouth, who are want to sort of maximise and optimise their uh, vapour deposition um, manufacturing process. And finally, Hanlon's is a brewery just outside Exeter, and we, that's very much a new product development and the marketing project. So hope that gives you a flavour of the sort of projects that we can 
um, cover and sort of projects we've historically covered. And sorry, this is a, a very quick snapshot of the whole of KTP, so it's quite a lot to get through. Um, summary though, if you think you've got a strategic problem um, that you can't really solve on your own and would think there's another area for collaboration with the university, you know, is it innovative, challenging, is it transformational, then if those answers are yes, it could potentially be a KTP. So uh, I am one of three. I've got a colleague, Yana and, and Val as our admin, so we can very quickly um, get to the bottom and explore if there's a potential KTP. Um, I'll just mention quickly a couple of other initiatives that aren't live at the moment, but hopefully will be live soon. They're also looking at a, a short KTP model, which we used to have a few years ago. It was discontinued, and now they're looking at trying to... Uh, restart that um, i think the actual kind of framework of the pro of the of the ktp out of work is sort of sorted out it's really i think now waiting for a method to fund it um, and also within the university ourselves within our department we used to use we've run a r d solutions fund where we um sort a pot of money and then very much like what we've been talking about clear myself about collaboration these were very much to fund you know kickstarter collaboration between a company get and academics to access their knowledge or facilities so the common theme is really collaboration how we can help you and how we can you know kickstart or accelerate the business to achieve its full potential so thank you very much for your attention um obviously our contact details are there i guess this, this has been recorded and these slides might be shared anyway but um if you want to speak to either me or um or yana or the enterprise solutions address here is a general entry into the university which is often if you don't know, not sure exactly what you want, that's quite a good way to come into the university because that is monitored and that will then be directed to the right person. So there's a number of ways of um, you know, getting hold of us and there. We've updated our, um, our KTP website, so I hope that should be quite up to date and we'll give you more information about stuff I've covered very quickly. So I think we're going to general questions now, so I'll stop sharing and hand back to Chris. So thank you for your attention. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, thanks for that overview. Uh, really useful. And I think, um, like Claire mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's, we thought we'd um, highlight, bring you into the conversation here, because it's good to, you know, through what we're offering through the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund, it could be that it's a sort of pilot or a test, and then it could be that that could then develop into a KTP afterwards. Um, so really keen that's why we, that's what we've involved Dave here and or it could be that a KTP from the start is 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 what you're after so we're really keen to sort of highlight what else is on offer from the university and really sort of see what what could benefit you the most um so really keen to sort of yeah highlight what else is available but also yeah the net the, the Devon Ezra Innovation Fund could be a platform to push on from um but yeah, really keen to open it up out really to see if anyone's got any questions related to either Dave or, or Mark or around the fund more generally and, and any clarifications um, that, that we can highlight now just to, just you know from the early from the early point in terms of what the fund does cover, what it doesn't cover um, and things like that. So any specifics that, that we can answer whilst we're here. I mean Claire Claire showcase the website and, and we can send that link around but um if there are any clarifications we're really keen to go through them now um as well so we've got a bit of time to do that so either yeah more than welcome to put your hand up um or put something in the chat um we can start with the question that, that came through from mark a sort of specific question around um i think one of the graphs he highlighted um, Mark, I don't know if you've seen that in the chat. There's a question from David Stone that's, that's sort of talking about embodied carbon. Um, I think in relation to the graph you might have showed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, embodied carbon is not not particularly my bag, but um, I've done a bit of work in that area, and I know it's it's still quite a live topic at the moment, actually. But um, yeah, there's. I think the question is generally getting at the, um, you know, is is there all, all these great new products just creating more carbon than they're saving? I think that's the general gist of the question. Um, <clears throat> and the general answer is, is no. So gem, generally, um, there's a, a carbon payback, I guess, when you create a new product. So you, you, use, you create some carbon emissions when you, you know, make some insulation or make a heat pump. 
Um, and so therefore is does that offset more than the carbon saved in the lifetime of the product? And generally, the, you know, there's a carbon payback of like a year or two with most things. And it varies like product to product and depends on where you draw your boundaries and you can get into really complicated life cycle assessments of things that, that certainly isn't my field. Um, but generally, the answer to those things is, you know, most of them pay, pay back that sort of carbon debt within a year or two. Um, and the more the, the more our economy decarbonizes, the less significant that is generally. So the more our electricity is decarbonized, the less significant the electricity that goes into making a product becomes. Um, so it's it's all part of that exponential trajectory. Um, so yeah, I hope that's helped. It's about as far as I can go in that area. Great, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, there's a question come through, which is from Ben. Uh, thank you, Ben, um, around Profit and IP, I guess I'm, I'm presuming this is in relation to the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. Um, are there any implications on R&D tax credits? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I mean, as, as the whole project as a whole, Low Carbon Devon, as Claire mentioned, we, we, we can work with Devon-based businesses who are eligible through the project. And through that, we do an eligibility check um, in terms of any state aid funding you've had before. Um, but I don't believe that um, R&D tax credits sort of um, are a hindrance to that, but I'm not entirely sure and I'd be keen. Um, yeah, we can get back to you on that unless Claire has any specifics related to that that she could share. The only thing I was going to mention was the support that any company gets through Low Carbon Devon is called de minimis state aid. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and your question around profit and IP, uh, the application form asks about background IP. So if you're coming to the partnership with IP or the academic is, that's something we'll have to sort out on a, on a case by case basis. So hopefully, Ben, that does answer your question. No communicating in the chat. Yes, yeah. oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great, Claire. Thank you for that. Um, there's some more questions coming in. Thank you for that. Um, let me just skim through the chat. So a good question from Emma. Thanks, Emma. Um, in relation to, you know, are the projects uh, for the fund expected to focus primarily on carbon? Uh, what about other emissions, sustainability challenges? Um, yeah, low carbon, the low carbon economy, the focus of the project is, you, know, you could look at that and it is, is really broad, um, which is great because I think it means we can link a lot of things to it. But I think there has to be a clear sort of carbon reduction focus. Um, and again, like to reiterate what Claire said, we can really look at this on a case by case basis. Um, so we're really keen to be, to be broad, but the link, but there to to be a link around reducing carbon emissions or around the low carbon sector. So if you can identify that link um, would be the main thing. Um, but if you're not sure, um, I'm really keen, you know, I can have a follow-up conversation with, with you on the phone or, or a video call and maybe go through some ideas you have. And if you're not quite sure, we could, we could sort of discuss those and explore it in more details and maybe maybe we could highlight the link to, to low carbon. But we're really keen for it to be broad and there, there to be a mixture of projects. So around different different sectors or industries or focuses. So, so as Mark showed in his graph, you know, he, he highlighted energy, transport, food, um, buildings, waste, I think there are a few others. So we're really keen for there to be a broad mixture of projects but to really highlight that there is a link to, to reducing carbon emissions. Um, so again, really keen to pick that up. If you've got a specific, we, we can chat about it in detail um, afterwards. But that's a really good question. Thank you, Emma. Um, any other questions coming through? Um, a question from David. Thanks, David, again. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a specific one. I think, yeah, um, 
I'm keen. Uh, yeah, we could have a follow up conversation around that, uh, developing that piece of work. I think um, the the fund is is sort of it can be there to to sort of develop an existing collaboration. So so if there's an existing relationship, so if if you're in the audience and you're a local organisation and you're already working with an academic um, at the University of Plymouth. The fun could be to develop that piece of work and research or if, if you don't know of an academic that's great too our, our job is to help you find the correct expertise and um, that was a question we've been asked previously so just to highlight that as well so if you have a project and you have an idea but you don't have a university link we can help with that and find the expertise and then the the application for the fund is then put in together so it's a collaborative partnership from the outset in terms of the design and the sort of co-design of the project. So if you have a really great idea, be like, oh, I don't have an academic to work with, get in touch with myself and Claire, and we can sort of find out through contacts through Dave, for example, as he highlighted, Enterprise Solutions, and we can do our best to, to find the appropriate academic who would be interested. And we're similarly talking to academics who are interested in it collaborating with with local businesses so so really encourage 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 that so yeah we can discuss that in more detail um thanks dave and similarly maya thank you for the question uh related to carbon footprints um uh, developing it yeah Again, really good question. Um, I think if it's re in relating to developing a new product or service for, for yourself, which then goes on to reduce carbon emissions, I think that would be eligible. Um, I think we could, we could check around it, but that, from my understanding, that's, I mean, that's, that's part of the focus as well. So your, your service or product, for example, the carbon footprint calculator, um will then go on to have that positive impact and that be the sort of driver of that product um i agree we yeah. could develop that further so yeah i think that sounds great yeah sorry claire do you want to add anything no sorry i was just going to say i agree because actually you're a dev it'll be a devon company you'll be developing new products and it's benefiting the low carbon sector so that's ticks all around so yes thank you maya Great, thanks very much. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I was thinking we can't prove that we'll reduce carbon because we still depend on the other side getting involved. But I suppose that's with another product. If people don't buy it, you won't have reduced carbon. So <laughs> you can only offer, make your offering, and then absolutely the response depends on the public and your marketing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, just have a quick skim through in case i've missed anything if you've got any final ones do you do you put them in or or do follow up a conversation with myself i mean a few things that that i could highlight just to clarify that we've been asked previously um by over the past couple of weeks via emails um was around you know we're called it's a it's a fund um but it's not sort of capital money um so it's a fund to to sort of in a way, one way of describing it is is to sort of buy out that academic expertise time. So the, the fund is to fund the time um, in terms of advice, in terms of sort of research development. Um, and that can, it depends on wh who the academic is and, and who the researcher is, but it's approximately around um, 300 hours of time. And that could be spread over the, the duration of the fun so just to give you an idea of what that might look like that that might be quite i just thought i'd mention that in terms of it's this seven thousand five hundred figure but it relates to approximately around 300 hours um are there any other key points that, that you feel we need to highlight at this point claire i don't think so not unless um there are any other questions that come out um yeah yeah sorry no i'm just looking through no i don't think so i mean do you want Ooh. me to bring up do you want me to bring up your closing slides 
Yeah, that's no, that sounds oh, great. Oh, there's a question from Polly. She put her hand up. Hi, guys. Just a quick one, just to pick up on um, the capital point there that you raised. I'm Polly Frost. I work in the economy team in Devon County Council. And following a conversation with Claire, we have a... Um, I'm trying to think of a nice word, a similar fund, but a fund that will work seamlessly together with this one that does have a capital element. So um, Claire's got information about that and it, we're not quite ready to launch the fund yet. But if there are people out there who are looking for a project that does require an element of capital, please, um, I guess, you know, flag that with, with Claire or Chris and they can get in touch and we can probably join that up as seamlessly as possible behind the scenes. Thank you, Polly. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Polly. And yeah, no we, if you know, if if we start a conversation with, with um, businesses in the audience, we can do. We'll do our best to highlight other opportunities around around Devon as well, um, like that one, for example. But if we feel like there could be a fit with another project, um, but actually, yeah, we'll connect you with those as well. So. The Low Carbon Devon project I mentioned at the start is based within the Sustainable Earth Institute, but we also have other projects within the SEI and across the university. So um, it could be, we could set up a chat with myself and then it could develop onto something else as well. Um, so do bear that in mind. And, and just to sort of summarise really, um, what we can offer through Low Carbon Devon, you know, as I mentioned at the start, we're really here to support, to facilitate and empower sort of practical solutions and action around the low carbon agenda and around taking action on climate change. Um, so we can offer, so the internship program is one of those mechanisms um, as I highlighted and I'm keen to chat further about that as well as the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund, which has been the focus of today's event, but also the research collaborations with our four industrial research fellows um, and also a series of events and workshops that, that we're running um, as a team as well. And they are open, the focus is Devon-based businesses and SMEs, but they are sort of, quite a lot of those are open to the public and open wider than that as well. So thank you for the slides, Claire. Um, so just to reiterate that, to have a think, reflect on, on what, we've, what we've presented today um, and just to sort of highlight really what what is your next step? So if, if your next step is just to have a phone conversation with myself or, or go and have a look at the website and reflect on some of the, the criteria for the fund, do go away and do that. And, and I'm really keen to chat and, and see how we can support and, and help, help you take action, basically. Um, so that's what we're here to do. And I'm really excited to do that. So yeah, those are my contact details. Um, you know, feel free to make a note of those now or, or print screen or we will be sending out a follow-up anyway after the event um, with our details about how to get in touch and we can share sort of information that Dave and Mark have also shared. Um, also just want to say thank you to to my other colleague Hayley who's who's been helping out with the event. Um, so a huge thank you to Hayley and to, to Claire as well and also to yourselves for coming along. Um, it's a beautiful afternoon so do go and enjoy the last of the sort of summer sun uh, i'm still calling it summer so yeah do go do go outside and really keen to continue the conversation hopefully this is just the start of a, a relationship and a conversation and also thank you to to dave uh to dave marshall for coming along and talking and thank you to mark howard from regen as well really appreciate your time this afternoon um so yeah i think that's all from us um, thanks very much. And yeah, have a lovely, lovely afternoon. And hopefully see you soon.